Today we are starting a new little reading project, which is trying a new author. And I've done one of these before, that was with Attica Locke, and I felt like that was a rousing success in terms of I really enjoyed spending some concentrated time with an author I've never read before, and kind of trying to articulate what I think their deal is, and figure out what about their work does and doesn't work for me. Obviously I'm trying to do this with authors who I think I'm going to enjoy their work. Uh, and today's author I have been highly anticipating for a while and just keep not getting to their work and we're finally going to do it today. So today's author is Sylvia Moreno Garcia and she's a chameleon. She's written a lot of different kinds of books uh, but I'm going to read three from her. This is inspired by the fact that I have an arc of her newest release this year which is I believe, ooh I forget the full title. I think the last word is nitrate. It seems like it's a horror novel having to do with like Mexican cinema and it is going to be one of the books that we read but let me throw you to different Mara telling you about the other two that we're gonna read. Let's talk about the other two books from Silvia Moreno Garcia that I'm going to read for this vlog. So first of all I wanted to go with the original book that I was interested in from her that has been on my shelf for a good long while now and that is Gods of Jade and Shadow. This is kind of like a fantasy retelling of Cinderella from what I can understand but like with Mexican folklore traditions interwoven and it's got mostly positive reviews a little bit I mean you know with any book this size you're gonna get a little bit of good and bad in there too. So I thought I would include the one that's been on my radar the longest and that I've owned from her the longest. So I have that one. I wanted to include her newest release which I have an e-arc of so that will be my second book and then my third book. Theoretically I wanted to pick her most popular book. I thought that would be a good way to round it out but that's no <laughs> because it's Mexican Gothic and I cannot deal with it because my understanding is that it has a lot of fungi horror in it and that I know. No, 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 not for me. That is, that is like my Achilles heel, I can't deal with it. So the next most popular book besides Gods of Jade and Shadow, which actually maybe it was Gods of Jade and Shadow that was the most, but the second was Mexican Gothic. I don't know, It's those were the top two. But number three was The Beautiful Ones. And my understanding is that this is kind of like a Pride and Prejudice-esque romance of manners, I think, but set in like a, ye fantasy world. This is kind of, it's still a fantasy world. It's still, I think, got a little bit of like, he's hiding something from her, but it also is supposed to have a good bit of romance to it. So that is our third pick. And I think between those three, I should be able to give you my impressions of Silvia Moreno Garcia's kind of vibe as an author and what her strengths and weaknesses are. I'm really excited for this one because she, her whole deal is that she purposely writes in a lot of different genres. Like that's a part of her sort of project. Whereas Attica Locke, when I did that video, all three of those books were very similar in terms of genre and tone. I'm expecting that th these three books are gonna be pretty different. So I'm excited to see kind of like what the commonalities are and how, like where am I gonna land on having a sense of her as an author? Because there's not gonna be continuity in the kinds of books that they are. So I'm hoping that there's gonna be something I can say about like, these are themes that she seems to be playing with or certain character types or certain elements or certain references. So I don't know, I'm excited to see where this particular version of this concept takes us because I'm honestly not totally sure what to expect. Okay guys, I finished them all. Yay! I did a good job of making sure I read these kind of like back to back to back so that I got the full flavor and enjoyment. I read Silver Nitrate last because that's the one that's coming out this year and I just have that as an ebook. Uh, I read Gods of Jade and Shadow first and The Beautiful Ones in the Middle. So intro, yeah, I don't know what I was expecting but what I found is a little different than what I expected. So maybe let's start with talking about my impressions of the individual books and then I'll move into talking about kind of the overall 
themes or what I think SMG's vibe is. So we'll start, we'll just go into the order I read them. Gods of Jade and Shadow is, I would describe this as folklore or like a, a fairy tale kind of atmosphere based on Mayan mythology. And it's sort of a, it starts with a little bit more of a Cinderella feel, but I think it's ultimately kind of like Death and the Maiden. And uh, it's a quest fantasy story uh, with our main character Cassiopeia, who inadvertently unleashes the God of Death and has to go on a quest to try to get everything back in order. Um, this one definitely has that mythic quality to it. I think if you're not into that kind of semi fairy tale ish way of moving through time and plot, I could see this not working for someone. But for me, I actually really, really like that quality, uh, especially once I kind of realized that that was what the vibe was. I think that the way that the mythology is portrayed is really compelling. I have found that I, I seem to really enjoy um, the indigenous peoples of South America and Central America interpreted into fantasy. I've read several of those and all of the magic or sort of fantastical elements of those have really worked for me. Um, so I also really enjoyed that in this book. So I really enjoyed this one. Good start. I gave that one four stars. The Beautiful Ones is, think, maybe not Pride and Prejudice, but think kind of that drawing room novel of manners meets magic. So our main characters are kind of in, it's kind of like a melodrama, I guess. Like it's a, Hector is coming back to try to reclaim Valerie's heart but Valerie is married to this dude who is the cousin of Nina, who's really kind of our protagonist. They're all kind of getting in the mix with each other. So maybe like Edith Wharton, House of Mirth meets fantasy by way of Mexico. I really love the way that the relationship in this one progressed because Hector, you know, the book that this actually kind of reminds me of a little bit is Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. I would say I haven't seen those as being comp to each other, but to me, both of them are sort of historical fantasy romances. This one being more of like a literary-ish kind of take on that. More, more literary. Um, yeah, I, this is probably my favorite of the ones I read. I'm between a four and a four and a half on it because I do think that Nina is a little Mary Sue. So I kind of want to see how I'm feeling about it in like a week and that will just determine if it's a four or four and a half. But I did, I really like this one. This one was my favorite. And then Silver Nitrate is horror for sure with a, a speculative horror novel. Um, it's very slow burn. So I would actually sadly say that it's probably my least favorite of the three. I would still give it four stars though. <laughs> That's kind of cutting to the chase though. It seems like SMG is a solid four star author for me. Like I, there's things that I can quibble with, but ultimately I have a lot of like respect for the writing. And anyway, sorry, kind of cutting to the next part of the video. But anyway, I would give this still four stars, even though I think if the first 10% if the first quarter of it had been trimmed to 10%, for my taste, it would have been a much stronger book because once you get into the meat of the story, I think that this is a really effective horror novel. So uh, where we ultimately land at, and I do think that this is on the back of the book, so I don't think that these are spoilers, but like I said, it takes a while to get here, so that's the only reason I have some hesitancy, But but I would say in essence, we have two people who have been lifelong friends. One of them is kind of pining for the other one. And they're both in the Mex Mexican sort of like pulp film industry. Momo is a sound editor and Tristan is sort of a commercial actor. And they both have, you know, backstory reasons why they're not thriving these days in the cinema and uh, they encounter this older filmmaker and he brings them into this story of kind of like pulpy horror, but real from the 60s. And they get swept up 
in trying to fix something that went wrong back then. So once that kicks in, I think that it's a really, like maybe the most commercial of any of these books, once you get to that point, in terms of wide appeal in the story, I really, really, really liked essentially the back 75% of the book. Um, but the first 25% for my taste was just like really kind of slow. So all that being said, like I said, I gave all of these four stars. So in terms of transitioning to some of my findings and kind of like what I think the secret sauce of SMG is, they're just, she's really just a very proficient technician of her craft. Uh, her writing is really, she has a very distinctive voice in her writing. And I think it's because her distance, so okay, how to say this. So you talk about point of view in a book, first, second, third person. And then you also talk about third person omniscient, um, third, third person limited, like there's some of those nuances. She straddles a line between third person limited, meaning it's not, I went to the store, I bought some milk, it's Mara went to the store, Mara bought some milk. So like I've, I, third person limited in the sense of it's staying with that character and what they would know, uh, but like one step closer to omniscience. So there's this kind of perspective from the author or the narrator, let's say, that has a bigger picture of how the third person limited point of view fits into the overall story and into the overall world, which I think keeps might be why I struggle to fully love one of these books, because I'm always feeling a little bit distant from the characters, even though I definitely am really emotionally involved in them, particularly in the beautiful ones. I was like, Valerie can go jump in a lake. <laughs> I was really into the dynamics between Hector and Valerie, and is his name Gallatin, I think, the cousin, and Nina, and Etienne, like all of them I was really into, but I always felt a little removed from them, even in this one, which I think is the closest in the point of views. So, and, and you know, in Gods of Jade and Shadow, it makes more sense to me because there is this sort of fairy tale element which makes sense to me that there is a little bit of a distance from the narrator to the limited point of view. So it, this, when I first read this, I just chalked that up to the type of story she was telling. But by the time I was at the end of this one, and definitely by the time I got to Silver Nitrate, I was like, yeah, you know, there's just a little bit of remove that is keeping me from loving these characters in a way that I probably would need to for her to just be like, hitting it out of the park for me. So that's one thing I've noticed in terms of a unifying theme. Um, the other thing I was aware of going into this project is that she does not stick to one specific genre per se, but I think now having read at least sampled three of her books, the what I would describe as her unifying kind of genre is historical fantasy. So she's taking on a lot of different sort of subgenres within that. So for instance, the horror element in Silver Nitrate, but it is taking place, I guess, in the 90s, like the early 90s, which I know is borderline for historical, but certainly not taking place in the present. And a lot of it is centered on events from kind of the mid-century. So there's that, that's like a horror flavor of historical fantasy. Uh, Gods of Jade and Shadows takes place in kind of like the Jazz Age. Um, so that would be like in the early 1900s. And this one, like I said, the vibe is more sort of fantasy quest, epic fantasy with sort of a mythic quality. And then uh, this version of historical fantasy is sort of a historical fantasy romance or novel of manners. So I would say the unifying overall umbrella of her work seems to be historical fantasy, but lots of different variation and flavors and uh, definitely very different worlds. And yet they, you can, she does have a certain sort of fingerprint that it does feel like her always and sort of the narration style and the kinds of characters and the sort of sets setups and dynamics like it definitely she has a flavor to what she's doing but it's being applied to all of these different subgenres within that historical fantasy umbrella which i think is really cool and is an interesting thread of 
keeping things fresh because she has a lot of variation in what she does. Always it's still feeling like her and I think appealing to a core demographic who is looking for, I guess the other adjective I would probably layer on top of that is maybe literary historical fantasy. I think she is appealing to a reader who values um, a certain sophistication in some of the theming, a certain sophistication to her writing style and overall approach to the story. Like, I think that's who she's kind of going for. So I just, I appreciate the variety. And she's definitely an author I will be looking for in the future because I think she's one who's like constantly kind of keeping people, like keeping us on our toes, so to speak. She's keeping it fresh. So I think that's really cool. The other thing that surprised me in her work is that she seems to be like me and be a little bit of a softy. All three of these books had an unexpected element of romance. Now, I did kind of expect that from the beautiful ones because I'd seen this compared to Pride and Prejudice. So I was expecting some romance there. But the other two books, I think, also have a really strong romantic element. But they're not saccharine romance. Like, if you're somebody who doesn't want like it just to be an easy romance. None of these relationships, like the romance is there in all three. Um, I don't want to spoil Gods of Jade and Shadow, but like that one is clearly a very dark version of it. Cause like I said, it's a little bit of a death in the maiden kind of situation. But even in Silver Nitrate, like by the time, like I love the way that that piece of the story ended. And I felt like it's a unrom it's an unromantic romantic relationship. So it's not happily ever after. It's not romance genre. Maybe that's the way to say it. It's not saying like, oh, and then we all live happily ever after. It's we're living happily ever after with no illusions about the realities of life, if that makes sense. But anyway, I really, really like that. I mean, I always, you guys know, I always say my favorite kind of book is one that is mystery plot engine, speculative elements, romantic subplot. These don't necessarily have like a mystery plot engine, but they definitely have the speculative and then the romantic element. So for me, that really works and was not something I was expecting at all. And I feel like it's, you know, kind of like I was talking about how Aquake and Mezzi, when they were doing that, their take, like a literary version of a, a genre romance. This one, I think, feels closer to traditional genre romance, historical romance vibe. It's closer to the vibe, but it still has a certain freshness to it to me because it's just coming from a different angle than I think traditional genre romance, like something you're gonna get from Avon would do. I don't know if any of that makes sense. I think you have to kind of read it to understand, but I appreciate both the familiar, I guess where I'm going is I appreciate both the familiarity and the freshness that I'm finding and the way she does her um, romantic elements because I'm that person that I'm always looking for the couple. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, here's the couple, but things don't necessarily play out as idyllically as it might in a genre romance, even if they're ultimately couples that are getting together. So anyway, I really like that element. And yeah, just thematically, I think that there's a lot in here about class in particular that seems to me to be kind of a unifier between all three, particularly in the first two in Gods of Jade and Shadow and the Beautiful Ones. There's a lot about class in this and the difference between having a certain class you're born into versus having money. I think it's definitely there. I will say all three of her heroines, I think in a less skilled author's hands, could be viewed as not like other girls kind of heroines, but they don't go all the way there. But I do think that she's interested in female characters who are a little bit out of step with the world around them. That seems to me to be unifying um, some things around race, for sure. Definitely in Silver Nitrate and Gods of Dune and Shadow in particular, and just navigating kind of the complex landscape of race in Mexico and Central America vis-a-vis -vis its indigenous population. And then Silver Nitrate, I think, has a lot about kind of like white supremacy stuff. So um, yeah, that also seems to be an element that's present. But overall, I think my takeaway is I can really count on Silvia Moreno Garcia to give me a book that even if it doesn't end up being a favorite favorite, one that's really thought provoking, really well executed and appealing to me, like her sensibilities really connect with me. But it is, I think that if she didn't have that sort of slightly removed quality to how she's dealing with her characters, I think that these would be like four and a half or five star books just because 
because I'm such a character driven reader, I want to be a little closer to my characters. Like I said, we'll see in a week how I'm feeling about this one. I could see myself giving this a four and a half ultimately because I did really, this was the closest to working for me on a character level. So with all that being said, very successful trying a new author project here. Uh, and I will definitely continue to look for her books. I think particularly this is going to be one where I look for descriptions that appeal to me because I think she's pretty consistent in her quality from what I can tell. So it's more just about like, does this individual book sound like one that's up my alley? But it seems like she's pretty consistent. So yeah, big success. My next one like this is going to be with Deanna Rayborn. So stay tuned for that sometime in the next few months. And uh, yeah, I think that will do it for me for this one. So let me know what you think about this particular author. If you think that there are read alike authors or titles to anything that we talked about today, definitely put that in the comments in case people are looking for recommendations or I'm looking for a recommendation. Let me know that below. And yeah, I think that that will do it for me. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!